Good morning, ladies, and welcome to this week's Parsha, Parsha Schukas, which is jam-packed full of amazing, very important topics, and we are taking a different topic this year. Usually in this week's Parsha, we have both the Patira of Aaron and Miriam. We have uh, the Nachash Hanachoshes, we're going to touch upon that briefly today as well, the copper snakes that... Um, Moshe Rabbeinu fashion when there was a whole plague of, uh, of snakes, which killed several Jews or infected several Jews, but that way didn't kill them, sorry. And there was also the, there was also the, um, the big one was the May Mariva, the idea of Moshe hitting the rock. We did that for the last few years, so I'm not going to touch that this week. What we are going to touch is the beginning of this week's Parsha, speaking about Zos Chukas HaTorah. This is the, the Chok, the, the laws of the Torah that are not always so easily understood. And we're learning the laws of what's called the Para Aduma, the red heifer. Now, I'm just going to adjust my thing here because I don't like the way it looks. Oh, we're getting wrong. One second. Okay. Um, never adjust this till we start. All right. Anyways, so let's let's talk about this. Something that you know is very even Shlaima Hamelech, who knew languages of all the animals and knew everything, did not understand the secret of the red heifer. Did not understand the paraduma. He said that the, 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 there's a pasuk. He said, "Amarti echkema vehi many." He said, "I thought I would make myself wise by understanding the rationale between the laws of paraduma, the red heifer." but it's too distant from me. Even he didn't understand it. Let's briefly go through what was involved with this. The para aduma, we should merit, it's a shem to have it, bekar of mamish in our days. The, um, the red heifer was something, it had to be a cow about three years old that never had a yoke on its back. And there's a way to tell apparently by the way that hairs stand on the neck. Uh, it's gotta be all red. And I think it can't have more than two hairs that are black, that are not red. And it, um, this, this was, you know, the, the Sanhedrin or the Basin would acquire this particular cow. There was a whole procedure done by Kohanim where they would slaughter it and they would uh, sprinkle it in some parts of the Mizbeach and then they would mix it with some type of water. They would burn the ashes and the ashes of this paraduma mixed with water. And also they would hold, another thing that was used in this whole process was two bushes, a very tall one, the Erez, which is the cedar tree. And then the Azov, which was a very low little bush, they call it the hyssop. And also a scarlet thread were used in this process. And they would use this with pure water to purify somebody who had been defiled by being either in touch with a, a person that had passed away or in the same room with a person that had passed away. Uh, who, you know, in, in any case, on the third and seventh day, he was sprinkled or she was sprinkled with the Sparaduma and um, they were purified. Now, this is very important. You cannot go to the base Hamikdash without being purified by the Paraduma. And this would be very common on like, uh, Hagim on the Yom, on you know, any Yantif when people would make Aliyah Laregel, they would go to Yerushalayim, there'd be hordes of people. My video is not clear. I don't know what to do about that. I really don't. <laughs> There's not that much I can do here. Um, all right, in any case, the Paraduma would be something. Uh, would be something that they would sprinkle on. Okay, thank you. And anyways, the paradu would be something that they could sprinkle on the uh, on the person. Let's try to get this straight. Okay, so they would sprinkle the the ashes of this paradu with those with those other ingredients on the person on the third and seventh days, and all these hordes of people would come to Rishalim to get purified. And only after waiting like the week, a week, a week period with this yeah. sprinkling and everything going on, would the person become purified, tahor. And then they would be able to go into certain sections of the base of Migdish that previously 
were closed to them. Now, what's very complicated about this paraduma, oh, first of all, there were nine in history. The first one made by Moshe Rabbeinu himself that lasted a very long while. They would use it when mostly when people would go up to Yerushalayim, but there could be, you know, any time a person would want to, it doesn't only Elio Regal, any time a person would want to be purified from being in, with a mace, he'd have to be purified. The Kohanim needed it frequently because they would be working in the temple if they had somehow come in contact with a corpse, they'd have to purify themselves. The 10th one, we've had nine in history and the 10th one, Mitz Hashem will be for, by the time of Mashiach. And um, the, the funny thing about Paraduma, not funny, but it's uh, interesting. The thing that made it like, it's a hoax. It's something we don't understand. It makes no sense that this is gonna purify a person. Well, first of all, Tuma, impurity doesn't make any sense. The whole idea of just this, you do this, it makes you impure, you do that, it makes you impure, doesn't make sense so much. We don't understand it in our human minds. But paradum of all things doesn't make any sense. It's something that um, the people involved in the whole procedure, any Kohen that either slaughtered the animal or that burned the animal and mixed the ashes with the other ingredients, all those Kohanim became impure. And then, but the whole purpose of the Paraduma ashes was to purify, but yet anyone involved in the process other than the sprinklers, once water was added, those people were not um, defiled, but anyone previous I, it became impure. It doesn't make sense. And then the whole idea of para, um, this all began after the time of the Cheta Egel, the golden calf. A para is reddish, just like a golden calf is reddish. And, and then the red, the, the, the scarlet string, this is also red. So usually if you want to purify someone, you think of the colors white. You wouldn't think of red, which usually signifies sin in, in many Jewish concepts, you know, many Jewish uh, sperm. Red signifies sin. If many psukim about it, you know, if, if your, your sins will be red, they'll become purified like snow. All of a sudden, we're using something red to purify, and then everybody that is in the process becomes impure. It doesn't make sense. Now, Rashi says, Zos Chuka Satara, why is this called the Chuk of the Torah? Levisha Satan Bauma Saola Monin is Sistro Lomar. The Satan, the, the Yetzahara, and the nations of the world will come to the Jewish people and say, Ma mitzvah hazos. What is this mitzvah about? The Matan Yeshba. What sense does it make? Levisha Kasab Bachuka, that's why it's called a Chuk. Gezerahim Malifani, the Emma Horishus Lahera Hara. This is considered a decree by Hashem. You can't, you can't figure out the real reasons, but we're gonna try to give some taste to the mitzvah, even though we don't understand the depth of it. Chazal say about this in Medrash Rabbah, in Bamidbar, we're told the Pesach from Eov, Mi tain tahar mitame lo echad. Who, except for Hashem, can make somebody pure that was impure? Kigon, Avram Miterach. We have Terach, who was an impure person, idolater, a big, the, the biggest fan of Nimrod, whose son was Tahar, came from Terach. Chizkiyahu me Achaz. Achaz was a wicked king. His son, Chizkiyahu, could have been Mashiach. Yoshiyahu me Amon. Amon was a wicked king. His son was Yoshio, who did a whole tshuva movement with the Jewish people. Mordechai Mishimi. This one I did not get to... Um, I did not research, but I wanted to include it just because it's interesting. It's uh, apparently there must be something impure about Shimi, who was the father of Mordechai. Yisrael me ovde kachavin. The Jewish people are purified compared to the rest of the world. Ha'olam haba me olam hazeh. And olam haba comes from olam hazeh. The next world comes from this world. Mi asa kein, mi tziva kein, mi gazar kein. Who made these things happen? Lo yechido shal olam. Only. The, the one and only Hashem, that there's only a singular thought and purpose there, and no one else could accomplish such a feat to make something impure, as something from, from something impure should come something pure. And it's very, very famous Rashi. We're told that the Paraduma, uh, it said a mother should clean up the filth of its child. So the filth was the sin of the golden calf, and the Paraduma is supposed to clean up the mess, so to speak, made. That, that the sin of the golden calf is always upon us in some way or another. 
and this is going to rectify that. Okay, so these are all the basic concepts, basic concepts given to us about the paraduma. But we have five questions. Question number one, if this is called Chuk Zos Chuk Satoru, the Parsha starts out by saying, these are the, 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 the laws of the Torah that we're not meant to understand. Those commandments that are, don't have an under, easy understanding. What do you mean Zos Chuk Satoru about Para Aduma, about the red heifer? Isn't there also uh, like shotness? Shotness, there are their explanations, but it doesn't make sense that you can't wear garments of linen and wool. Some things make no sense. Um, why is this one singled out of Zos? This is the whole Torah, is like Paraduma. How do we understand such a thing? Second question is. Um, Oh, okay, I'm sorry, there's only four questions because the first one incorporates two. The second one is, it just says Zos Chukas Hapara, this is the law of the cow. Instead it says the whole Torah, like this is how important, impactful the lessons will be that we're gonna learn today about Para Duma. It's as if the whole Torah is like based on them. Question number three, what does it mean that the nations of the world are gonna specifically get upset about Para Aduma? Why, That's, you know? Number 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 three, what is the idea when we talk about why is para aduma specifically used to purify the dead? Is there is there perhaps a connection? And there are some suggested connections between the two. Why specifically the ashes of the para aduma have to be utilized to purify from contact with a, a dead body? And last but not least, these ingredients. Is there a significance with all these different ingredients? The hyssop, we said the lowest bush, and the eras, the cedar tree, the tallest tree, and the scarlet thread, and water, and uh, and the offer of the paraduma. Also, something very interesting about the par. Another weird thing about it, by the way, is it was one of the only sec. It was burned and everything done outside the base of Mikdash, outside, and even in the time of the desert, it was not near the Mishkan. It was outside the camps of Israel. Uh, it also looked kind of you know interesting because that's something that usually you're not allowed to make a sacrifice of any sort outside Yushalayim, outside the, the place of Asa Megdash, the Paraduma was an exception. Okay, so let's first take a short, the short answer, and that'll be that of the Orachayim Akadosh. I saw this in the Lekach Tov, brought down from Chaim Shmulevitz. Um, here are the words, the holy words of the Orachayim Akado. She tells us, "Bederech remez." This is all a hint when we're learning about the, the the red heifer. There is a hint alluded in the whole thing that's done, all the ceremony that's performed with the paraduma. Yirtzeh ba'amro chuka satoro. What? It, it's a hint when it when it's talking about the chok of the Torah, the statutes of the Torah. If you keep this mitzvah, even though it makes no sense, you, it's, 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 you're considered as if you kept the entire Torah. Because if a person is going to keep a mitzvah they have no understanding of. It shows how deep-seated, deep-rooted your emuna is inside of you and how you have agreed to keep all the mitzvahs that Hashem has commanded you. That's what the Orchaim HaKadosh tells us. So there's really a very important lesson to be learned when we keep statutes of the Torah. Keeping a statute shows us that we are, in essence, we're not using our minds. We're just saying, Hashem, we're nullifying our will to do your will. You're the main thing. And we are really, that's really a service to Hashem when we have no understanding. There's no contribution of a human being inside. You're doing it for him and not for you. There's no me involved. The Mikdash Halevi, Rav Duner Zatzal, I think he's the father of the, the Rav of London, he wrote a safer called Mikta Shalevi that I like to dabble in every once in a while. And he says something, you know, the whole idea of Tameha mitzvah is the rationale to do a mitzvah. You know, 
we tend to choose food that we like the taste of, but that's such a small part in the whole digestive process. You know, usually all the benefits, the nutrients, the digestive system is the main thing. And then what we feel like after we've eaten, <laughs> you know, good or bad, whatever that is, that's, that's the, that goes on for hours after we've eaten something. Whereas a time, a taste, how long does it last? Seconds? You know, you taste something, it tastes so tremendous. And then it's over, it's over after a few minutes and that's it, the rest, the rest goes on for a long time. He says the idea we call, it's always in all the sperm, we use the term tameha mitzvos, the reason, the rationale behind mitzvos, it's just like eating, it's like food. Tam is just a taste. It gets you, it, get, it gives you a little geschmack. It gives you a little feeling towards something, but the actual thing that goes on long after, that's the main part. That's the main thing. This just lures you into the whole thing, but um, it, it, it's a very small little part of everything. Same, so too, if a person feels he rationalizes. Now we try to rationalize here a lot of things because we want to make the Torah more sweet for ourselves. It makes it more sweet. It's more palatable. And, and also to know the Torah isn't, a, it's very profound and deep, but there's a lot of profound profundity in the Torah that we as women don't even get the depth of, men get to study for hours a day. And we try to get some of it here to give us a feeling for Torah and to see how only the creator of the world could have created such a Torah. But it's not the main purpose to understand and to rationalize because once you rationalize, you're putting your own brain in and you can get yourself into trouble. Mikhail Shalevi says a fantastic example. He says 150 years ago, you know, it all of a sudden came out that if a person consumes pig meat, pig meat can have something called trichinosis in it, like a terrible uh, bacterial element only in pig meat, and people can get sick. So apparently there was a from doctor at the time who tried to make it palatable to others. And he told people, see, look, it's a, we see after thousands of years how the Torah makes sense, how pig meat is so dangerous. One Jewish doctor said that. What happened shortly after the reform rabbinate declared that now that pig meat is considered safe, it can't be us or anymore. It's not the forbidden food anymore. Now we can all eat it. If you, once we start rationalizing, once we start rationalizing danger lurks, we could start feeling, therefore we're allowed. And that's why Shlema Melech didn't understand Paraduma, which was the chok of all chukim, the, mo the, the, the most complicated statute that had so many contradictions within it. Why didn't Shlema understand? Shlema tent, he did one thing wrong. He said, Arba below Asur. He said, I will have more wives than the Torah allows me to have, and I won't turn away from Hashem, because it says, that's one of the few verses in the Torah that gives an explanation. It says, if a king, Jewish king, has too many wives, has too many wives, so he, he could turn away from Hashem. It says, Mar Benashim, Mar Bekshafim, uh, uh, whatever, that, um, you know, that women could get a guy crazy, and if too many of them can make you really crazy. Some people say, because, you know, women are hysterical to begin with, that they're, you know, some women are high maintenance, some women are lower maintenance, whatever it is, the, the idea is that, um, that he rationalized, I have more women, wives, and he felt there was a way to make a Kiddush Hashem. People will see that what a Jewish king is, but he rationalized and then he did, he committed, he did something wrong. And it, it did turn him away from Hashem. It didn't turn him per se away, but there was some element in his, uh, amongst his wives that people went the wrong way because Shlema had rationalized in that particular instance. So there's a danger of rationalizing and that's what we're supposed to, what the, the basic lesson we learned from the Paraduma is that rationalizing, besides what the Orchayim says, it takes us away from servitude. We're worshiping our own minds versus worshiping Hashem. And then also once we begin to rationalize, says the Mikdash Halevi, we start to go further <laughs> and then we can make up all kinds of explanations based on our rationale. That's one thing we can learn from the Paraduma. Let's take another concept that we can learn from the Paraduma. And that is, I saw this by Rev. Mordechai Miller, as a style from Gateshead. He brings down this forno who says that there are some elements, there's some hints and lessons we can learn from the Paraduma, although it is a chok. And one lesson is 
that by all the ingredients enumerated here, when you take the tallest tree, a branch of the tallest tree and a branch of the lowest bush, um, and you combine that with the paraduma, what we're really saying is a person has to find the golden mean, the middle path in life. Extremes are not appreciated in the Torah. Like for example, a person can't be so stingy, but they can't be spending their money too much either. You're not, you're not valuing your money and you don't mind if you go work another 50,000 hours to make up replenish for what you're just spending on. A person should be careful when they think about things like that. A person shouldn't be too complacent, but then a person shouldn't be too excitable. You know, all these things, it's a middle path and that's, you know, it being inclined to one side is no good. Um, that's why the, the para duma for some people would make you pure and some people would make you impure. It depends what side of the spectrum you're on. And that's a lesson for us that we, we have to find that middle path where, where we're not, you know, where it's not driving us away. You know, we always use the term balmidos. Balmidos means you're in control of your midos and your midos don't control you. And you, when we do something, we should, when you have the middle path, that means you, your mind is ruling you because people do tend to be, if you go au natural, you tend to be ruled by some part of yourself that has dominion. You know, a person is tend to be more excitable, let's say, or for whatever it is, person uh, jealous, or whatever, all these type of midos that a person has, if you don't find, if you don't rule over them, uh, then they rule over you. And the middle path means that you put, you're in, instilling some thought involved. We're so much enjoined to go to the middle that the Sefer Hasidim says, if there's a generation where people are lowly in a certain aspect, you should run to pursue the opposite. Because since the whole generation is going sour in one aspect, by you pursuing the opposite, you are going to keep yourself in the balance. We have to always work on that to have that balance. Rav Dessler says, Zetzal, he says, in the Shema, the Gemara says that when you say the word Echad, you're supposed to think of that Hashem is the only being in the heavens and the earth. Dalad means all the four, um, the four directions in the world. Ches means the eight, um, well, there's really like eight directions but four you know the eight incorporates here and also the um, north south east west up and down at six i'm sorry eight means something else i don't remember um i don't remember if anyone remembers they could tell me but in any case it's supposed to it's you're supposed to say the echad the dalad long enough to think about shamay the achdus you're supposed to think that's one Right, that, that everything is under one dominion that of Hashem. The Chayvah Salavavas and the Ramban say something different. They say that you're supposed to understand the philosophical concept that God exists and that, and that, you know, philosophically Hashem exists and he has the entirety of the whole world. You're supposed to think those thoughts when you say Echad. Now, it seems that they're a little bit different. So Rav Dessler says, each was countering the philosophy of their times. In the time of the Gemara, the Persians believed that there are two deities. There are two like things going on in the world, two gods. So to counter that, we had to focus intently on Echad, that there's just one God in all the heavens and earth, good and bad. Later on, when the, the, the challenge of the day was the philosophers, we're supposed to counter philosophize when we were saying Echad. So in other words, again, this idea of the golden mean, the middle, the middle road, our, you know, we have to, we have to go against it. We have to, you know, we have to work on countering it and having a, achieving a golden medium in our lives. So as of Mordechai Miller, today's problem does not involve philosophy at all. It's pretty, you know, apparent that today's, today's challenge is materialism. Like it says in the Chovas Olavavos, even in his time, but he was talking about, there was still philosophy involved. In the Haskalah, we're talking about in the 17, 1800s, there were still philosophical challenges to Torah. Today, it's pure materialism. Like it says, like the Chovas Olavavos' words, Osim bitneim Eloheim, they make their stomachs their gods, the Sorosam Malbushehem, and what's their dictates? The fashion, whatever fashion dictates is their rules, and what's their musr? Chizuk mishkanayim. 
beautify your homes, make them more nice and more nice. And that's what you're here in the world for. And we are supposed to go against our grain. So that's the main lesson of the, that's one big lesson of the ingredients used in the para aduma to teach us that sometimes we have to find that happy balance, that happy medium. It's metame, it's a tahorim, metayer, it's a tmeim. It depends on where you stand. It could be too much or too little to teach us. We're always supposed to strive for that middle path. Those are the thoughts of the Sforno and it brought to you by Rev. Mordechai Miller. Rev. Victor Miller gives another approach to answer some of the other thoughts of the uh, Para Aduma. He says, you know, in, in general, it's interesting. We never thought about it. Why is it supposed to be the worst tumma, the worst impurity being in contact with a dead body? Why? Why is that the worst? And why only use the Para Aduma, the red heifer? So it's interesting. He says, he says an interesting thought that I never thought about. And that is, he says that we know that uh, a, a, you know, as things go from something that's totally inanimate to vegetable world, to animal world, to man, the, the carcass of a dead thing gets worse and worse as far as repulsivity, as far as smell. Like an a, a inanimate object, like a stone, smells the same time, same way all the time because it doesn't have a life and death cycle. But then again, it has no strength to it. We find a vegetable, if it dies, it has somewhat of a rotten smell, but not as bad as that of an animal after it dies. And that is nothing in comparison to a human carcass because humans have such potential. But Ravigdor Miller says another little slant here. He says, why is it that a human carcass has such a smell? So we'll bury it immediately. You know, there's an idea of covet hamas. You're supposed to bury the dead as soon as possible. In Eretz Yisrael, where they're not limited by the laws, like we are outside of Israel, they have to bury within like six hours usually. Like that, as soon as possible, according to halacha. But in Chutz Aretz, you're not allowed to bury at night. So unless you get some kind of special permit. So we have, you have to do it within as soon as possible, within the 24 hours. But why is this so? Okay, that's covered a maze, which is one idea. But Rav Victor Miller says the reason we bury it right away is because the biggest tumma, he says, according to the Rambam, and I looked it over twice my notes because uh, and the, what he, his writings because I didn't see what he was referring to. But he claims, I just trusting Rav Victor Miller on this. He says the Rambam says the biggest tumma is the tumma of your mind. The, the, something is supposed to be considered repulsive. And it's considered, uh, you know, impure, impurities in the mind. What's impure about a dead body? He says the idea that you see someone alive and all of a sudden when their life stops, we think, oh my goodness, it's the end. So that's, that's an impure thought. You shouldn't think it's the end. We have to remove the body as soon as possible. You may think you could learn from it. You don't, don't even see a person unable to do anything. Why? Because if you see that, you're going to think that life ends with this world. He says that um, and, and the, the, a person is supposed to fill their thoughts. Yisparer vis amets, the words of the Masila Sisharm. A person has to clarify for themselves. That means you have to think about these thoughts and, and you know, uh, full, uh, inter think about them until it becomes clear to you that this world is a temporary world. The world to come is the world of reward. This is a temporary world. This is not where we're going to get anything. We have to think, and it's something, you have to internalize it. It doesn't come just by knowing about it, to feel it, that this world is temporary. And when a person realizes that this world is temporary, to internalize it, that what's your obligation? This world, this is not the real world. This is a temporary Plato, Plato world, as they say on the Vitakan hotline. Um, that this is a, it's not the real world. This is the temporary world. We have to internalize these thoughts. And when a person sees somebody, and if just says Victor Miller, he may start, oh my goodness, for one second, a thought will come into his mind. It's over. It's over. You're not supposed to think that way. You're not supposed to see a human being like that. A person is supposed to be in the state of influx always moving, always growing. A man is a hole. He's supposed to be growing all the time. And it's, and it's something that it's trade hazard to think that it ends there. We have to think about Olam Haba. 
Maves is similar to the word mush, mem vav shin, which means to move. You're only moving from one room to another. That's what we believe. You move from one room to the other, and that's the eternal life. That's the real life. That's where it starts. And the only place way, and the para aduma is the same idea. The para aduma only has value when it's dead. The para aduma is a beautiful animal. I'm sure it costs a pretty penny to get such an unusual, you know, with no, with no hairs that are another color, never had a yoke on it. But it's much more valuable to the Jewish people once it's burnt to ashes. The real essence of a human being where the real fun starts is the next world. And that's what we have to internalize in our lives. There's a way to internalize this. Victor Miller says, every time you see a fruit, every time you see a fruit, says Victor Miller, think of Olam Haba. You should think, look at the luscious colors and smells and tastes and so many species. This is just, a taste of Ma'ain Olam Haba. This is just what it's like. He said the first time he saw fruit tree, he was a city boy in New York. Uh, well, he was originally from, um, I, he was from Connecticut, somewhere around uh, Massachusetts, Chelsea, Massachusetts. And he, when he first saw a apple tree, he was 40 years old. And he said he couldn't believe it. You know, we take it for granted, but let every time we see, you know, there's a story about Vic Jim Miller in his biography that one time he went into a fruit store in, in Brooklyn and his Talmudian, somebody saw him there and they rushed over, Rebbe, can I help you with your purchases? And he says, I'm just looking. Now who would go into a fruit store just to look? But he did because he felt by looking at the fruit, it reminded him of look what the potential is for Olam Haba. We have anything in nature. The only thing not perfect is the way people conduct themselves in this world. But you can see the intricacies of nature, the gorgeous blue sky and everything. This is Ma'ain Ilam Haba. This is what it's like. This is what it, to internalize Ilam Haba. It's a, it's a job. And it's something we have to think of. He said a country road. Some people love traveling. They want to see what it's like at the other end of the road. <laughs> we'll have that opportunity, Amir Tashem. So we should make ourselves looking forward to that. When you have a chasana, a banquet, some fancy, uh, schmancy meal, this is Maine Alamaba. It's going to be fancier there and it doesn't end. He said, even eating breakfast, it's an opportunity. Look at this, the delicious taste that we have. Olam Haba, opportunities. And on Shabbos itself, Maine Alamaba, we sit at the table to reflect for a minute. He said, people should say at their Shabbos table, don't be embarrassed to say it to your children, to your grandchildren, to your spouse. This is Ma'ain Ilam Haba. Just imagine what Ilam Haba is going to be like. We have to internalize these ideas. Or another idea from Shabbos. It says, Misha Tarach Be'er of Shabbos, Yechel B'Shabbos. Whoever works hard on for Shabbos, you know, if you spend extra hours in the kitchen, extra hours at the supermarket, you have finer foods you're serving. You have better foods you're serving. So he says that's, that's, that's the muscle to Ilam Haba. The harder you work, in this world for Olam Haba, the better your table will be in the world to come. And the para duma we said only has its value after death. It purifies after death. That's when the good stuff comes. So we, a yid shouldn't, it doesn't reach his real purpose. Hashem is waiting to reward us. That's what Hashem, he wants us to have pleasure, but it's really supposed to be in the world to come. So Victor Miller says, it's a big lesson we could take from Paraduma and the, um, how bad Tumas Mace is for to teach us we should never stop moving because the main thing is after. The main thing is Ilam Haba. Those are the thoughts of Victor Miller. So to sum up midway, we can say we've taught, taught three different lessons. Well, three different lessons. Number one, rationalizing. It teaches us not to rationalize. It can be very dangerous. We're supposed to go after the golden mean and that olam ha where things count. So there are three lessons so far from a, from a mitzvah that has no meaning. We're learning three important lessons. Now, this one's a little bit deeper. This is brought to you by the Sifse Chaim, Rav Chaim Friedlanders itself. It was Meshkech and Panovich, the Talmud of Rav Dessler. Um, so he says like this, he has a different concept we can learn from the whole thing with Paraduma and from... Uh, in what it's here to purify in a deeper sense. 
the Sifzik Chaim says the following. He says, when did death begin? Death began when Adam, the first man, sinned. He, calcul he made calculations. Wasn't that his sin? Hashem told him, don't touch that tree. Don't eat from the tree, rather. Don't eat from the tree. Chava added the once. I'm still her daughter, and I added it on just now. Chava said, don't even touch it. But Adam Marishan was told, don't eat from that tree. One little pathetic mitzvah. Six hours he was alive, and he succumbed. Six hours. And that was all from rationalizing. Now, it's, it's beyond the scope of this class, but I'm just going to say it in brief a little bit about Chait Adam Marishan that basically the concept is like this, however we can imagine it, he had a Yetzirahara, he had an evil inclination, but before the sin, his Yetzirahara was called by like the morale and others, bachutz. what does that mean? If you can imagine such a thing, okay, there is a way we can imagine. Let's say for us, certain conquered territories we have in our life only remain is like an exterior Yetzirah. It's still there. It's still we could succumb to temptation. Like most of us would not eat something not kosher, let's say. It's still a Yetzirah, like something, you know, to, to, to run into McDonald's and, and grab a hamburger. Would, it's, it's definitely something would not be on our list. However, the idea of, um, the idea of, of uh, it's still there. It's still there. That, that's what his Yetzirah was like. It wasn't like in his flesh that he really had a desire for something before the sin, but he had like in his thoughts, you know, feelings, maybe I'd like this, maybe I'd like that. It wasn't burning within him like after the sin. He calls it, the Sif Chaim calls it Ratzen Atzmi. Like he didn't have his own desires. He wanted basically, his basic uh, uh, um, um, modus operandi was to serve Hashem. And then there were some side things a little bit, now is he's in, now that he sinned he's incorporated good and bad within him which means bad means he has his own desires i have what hashem wants me to do and then i have what i want to do two separate things battling within him at all times and this is what goes on in a person's body until they pass away from this world a person is challenged am i going to do what hashem wants or am i going to do what i feel like by the way, as an addendum, Rav Dessler said something very interesting. He says, if you want to know when you're having an argument with yourself what the right course of action is, he says, notice, usually your Yetzer Hatov will speak in the second or third person. That shows how much Ra has come within us. The Yetzer Hatov will tell us, you know, you shouldn't do this, or one shouldn't do this. The Yetzer Hara will say, I want it. That's interesting. He didn't, you have to understand the, the perspective of Adamarishan was like, not I want it. His I was what Hashem wants. And then maybe I'll do this, or maybe I want to do this. But the I was, was Hashem. Atzad, it gets to that level where the I, and that's why, you know, um, you know that, that's why Tzadikim are so holy compared to us. But um, the only, now with the goof, the body of a, of a person, even if they're, even Tzadikim, can only be purified once they leave their body. Because there's always an aspect from Adamarishan that there's a, I want. A total tzaddik, maybe the big tzaddikim in the time of the Tanakh, they say, you know, there's a, a whole idea given that maybe there's no tumma by tzaddikim like the Rashbi or by uh, Avram Avinu and these kind of people. And why? Because their, their body was resonating like Adamarishan you know, that they, they totally only wanted Ratz and Hashem. They didn't want anything else. But normal people and even many tzaddikim, unless they're on the level of these people in the, you know, maybe the Gemara, even time of the Gemara and before, um, most people need what's called chibut hakever, which is beyond the scope of this. They need to go through the pangs of death. And their neshama needs to be corrected in the olam ha neshamas to have perfection. And then eventually, by Tchiyas Amesim, the guf will have been perfected and the neshama will be perfected. And by the way, good news for all of us Jewish women, we'll come back by Tchiyas Amesim in our prime. We won't even need to use primer on our face. We'll only be in our prime. We'll be looking just perfect the way we always wanted to look. Any case, and we'll be in our prime in Yitz Hashem in, inside as well. When the Jews got the Torah, 
Okay, <laughs> when the Jews got the Torah, the um, uh, the, uh, the, we were on the level, they reached the level of Adam Arish with a little help from Hashem, like I was living in such an idyllic, idyllic uh, circumstance in the desert, giving the man and all Moshe Rabbeinu and everything else. When they got the Torah, uh, they were like Adam before the sin. But once they did the sin of the golden calf, where they were after, they were afraid, they're this, they that, the lack of a moon, the lack of bitachon, they needed to see something to remind them of Hashem because they didn't have Moshe. And all the things, whatever it is, that's a whole other discussion. Um, they, uh, they, they succumbed and they became like Autumn after the sin. Now, the, um, so then we need, from then on, we needed the para aduma. Now, when the nations of the world, they see good and bad, they see that as a contradiction. He says it, it's much deeper here, the Sefse Chaim. Before we said that, you know, it's such a, it's a big uh, um, statute that we don't understand at all. The nations of the world are going to come to us and say, what do you, what is this? This one you can't explain. You know, how are you going to explain this whole Paraduma thing? The, the nations of the world have a hard time explaining the concepts of good and bad, even to the point where in many religions, they have like the devil. They can't, they can't, they can't come to terms that Hashem could have anything to do with bad. You know, they, 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 they can't come to, or either it's a, a punishment, he hates your guts, and that's why you're going through this, or they have to blame it on the devil or all the other things. Now we know, and by us, even if you learn Torah, you see the Satan always represents Hashem. And even though it's the Satan, the Satan doesn't act outside of what Hashem wants. Hashem wants there to be a Satan. Hashem wants there to be evil. Hashem created all those entities. There's no separate idea here. And they have a hard time with the, you know, with these type of things. How could it come from the same source? So Adam Arishan, when he had his test, he was very wise. But whenever something bad comes, a temptation in this case, like he, his temptation was he wanted to lower his madrega. He said, if I disobey Hashem, I'll be in a lower level and then I'll come to it on my own. You know, a lot of people have this rationale, by the way. They say, why well, live in a firm neighborhood? You know? I'll have kids that are stronger in their religion. If they're, if they're, you know, on their own, they come to it. They don't have to do it because the Steins next door do it and the Schwartzes down the block do it. Let's do it because, you know, some people have that thought, but you're, you're, you're getting, you're tampering with, with danger there. Like, you know, of course you, you think you could do more, you know, if you had a broader scope to work within, but the entire purpose of evil is a test, temptation and test. Just like Paro, his whole existence was from Hashem but was supposed to be ultimately, we'd see his punishment. We'd see his downfall. Sometimes people don't understand why do I have to go through difficulties? What's the purpose of difficulties? But difficulties is to get closer to Hashem. A lot of times, um, in many ways, like in his case here with Adam Arishan, if he would have maintained his amuna and just, this is what God gave me a commandment. Let me stop rationalizing how I'm going to one-up him. I'm going to do a one-up if I, if I just purposely don't listen to him and I'll get more reward for it. I'll get more schar. You're going to, you're making yourself in trouble. That's, that's, and he has to see only Hashem's will is what's true and everything else is falsehood. He'd have lasted till Shabbos. We would have had Mashiach. We wouldn't have had to go through Gullus. Now, the paraduma reminds us of the sin of the golden calf. It's red in nature. It's the same animal. It's done outside, just like humans, just like the non-Jewish sacrifices were done. But we're doing it if we have to tang and do, if we have to entangle ourselves with evil, we're doing so because by entangling ourselves with evil, when God wants it, when God wants it, repeat that three times, not when we decide we're going to do it, but when Hashem tells us to do something that's difficult, that he puts us through difficult steps, um, it's this, you're showing, you're doing something that's supposedly you're dabbling with evil, but you're doing it to do ruts and Hashem then it, it's a correction. That's, that's the same idea of the mother coming to atone for her child, the, the, the mother calf. You're dealing with red, you're dealing with evil, but it can be an atonement if you use it to perfect yourselves. Let's give some better examples and we'll, we'll clarify this in a, in a more easy way. So you understand that, that evil can be used, but it's supposed to be used to either push away or if you do maintain it, 
you have to elevate it. And only when Hashem wants it, and, and it's under, un, non-understandable to others, like Shimshon Akipur was the prime example of that. He was a person who had to dabble with non-Jews and all kinds of other things. They said he could have been Mashiach because that's what the Mashiach is supposed to do, take the lowliest situation in the world and raise it up. And that's if Hashem gave it to us. That's if Hashem gave us a lowly situation. But there's not always idolatry as our threat. Like we find sometimes you can get from the lowest things come great things. Avram Avinu says to Sifse Chaim, because he was the son of Terah, he saw how idolatry gets you nowhere. That's why some Bali Tshuva have a clearer view than people from, from birth, because they have that aspect of looking at things and seeing it, it heightened their, 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 their truth seeking. He sees it gave him encouragement, like that's not the right path. So I'm continuing on my path. And all these people we mentioned before, like Chris Kiyoho being the son of a Russia or Yoshiaho being the son of a Russia, it only heightened their madrega that to realize this is wrong. You know, a lot of people, there were so many stories during the Holocaust of some people who, um, when they saw what the Nazis did, they said, look, the Nazis were laughing at us and they said, Look at you and look at us. Look what we've gotten and look where you've gotten. We control the whole world. We're dominating the whole world. And where's your Judaism? You're being sold. You're being destroyed little by little. Your morale has been destroyed. But we look at like, is this, if we want to be like a Nazi? <laughs> it doesn't matter if they're the majority and we're the minority. This should even increase the, the, the idea that we want to be like the world. Look what the world is. It stinks. We have that opportunity today, too. We see we can't trust anybody. Everyone's arguing over the vaccine. Some people think they're, they're in fraud and the whole Rob Bunham don't agree. Doctors don't agree. The whole that the whole world is in shambles. There's so much sheker in, in, in the Israeli government and all over the world, all the politicians. It's a one thing after the next. This should intensify our our motives, realizing this is not the real world because to fix this world right now would take God. I don't know. Only Hashem could fix the and the Shia could fix the world as it exists today. It's still, you know, personified. That's what it is. Avram Avinu, Asara Doros. There were 10 generations until Avram Avinu, and he withstood them all because that it helped him when he saw how lowly people can get. It made him remembering, you want to be that? This is who you want to copy. You want to get on your smartphones and, and be in touch with what's going on in the world? Look who these people are. Look what the world is. Look at the filth in this world. Is this what we want to be? You know, inspiration. Uh, evil has a purpose. It inspires us that this is not where we want to be, you know? Or in the case of Anamarishan, his evil was to, to remind him, don't rationalize. Don't rationalize. Don't think about it. It's so empty. It reminds us how empty it is. And that there's only ruts and Hashem to follow and everything is totally empty. And we burn the paraduma, says Rosif Sechaim, to show us that, that, that falsehood has no essence to it. It's totally irrelevant. It's totally really nothing. You know, they all say this on diets. I wish I could learn this for myself, but it tells you like you get a certain temptation for something. It could, if you just let it go, it could pass. It'll pass within a few minutes for anything. You know, it's a question because we see how really it's nothing. It's just like, a, you know, a thought in your mind or something you just saw or heard or whatever. We're being tested all the time. And if we just realize it has no essence, the whole essence is merely to test us or to purify us. And even when a person comes face to face with the worst things in life, it, and how it could be very depressing person, let alone going through sickness, all kinds of things. But one thing a person gets out of sickness is they really see how this world, we all counted on this world. It's nothing. It's nothing. The same idea with the, the copper snake. In the Midbar, the Yidden, um, when they were, they were trying to cross through Edom, they asked permission in this week's Parsha, and they were rejected. And Edom said, you cannot pass. So now they've got to go. And now, again, a lo the long way around to get to Eretz Yisrael. 38 years, they're already in the desert. And two, they're going to eventually need two more years of travel. People were really upset already. So they started complaining. They complained about the mun. They complained about the, the, the sh running around and schlepping. They can't, they feel like they can't take it anymore. So Hashem sent, why did he send serpents after them? Because snakes is lush and horror. They're complaining against Hashem. 
after all I've done for you for 38 years, miraculous existence in the deserts and the mun and the bear and the, the clothing never disintegrated on them, never had to do laundry. Can you imagine ladies? It's like the nine days forever, um, but it's not building up stinking in your basement. In any case, and then you, you have, you know, all these things are going on and you know, it, 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 and you never had to use the bathroom, never had to use the bathroom for 40 years, never had to wash your clothes. You know, all the wonderful, beautiful things in the midpoint, and yet they're still crutching and complaining, you know? <laughs> they said that sometimes like women, women are like the moon because they're always waxing and veining. They're always either crying or, you know, waxing their eyebrows. Anyways, so the, um, the, 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 they're complaining, Hashem sent the snakes after us to show us, what are you talking like the snake, the first snake, the, 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 the Yetzirah, Lashon Hara, like the snake said. So what was the cure? Moshe Rabbeinu Davins Hashem, what's the cure? He's told to make an image of a snake. He chooses copper because Nachash and Nechoshes sound the same. That's what the Mephoshim say. Plus, Nechoshes also, the snakes have like a coppery sheen to them, these dangerous snakes. So he makes an image of one and whoever was bitten should look up and look at this snake and he's going to be cured. Says the Ramban, if a person is a victim of something, usually if they see that thing, it's usually traumatic. It usually worsens the sickness. Usually, you know, it, it makes it worse to look at the thing that tormented you. In ancient times, like they said, person was bitten by a rabid dog. You should not see a dog. And, and even in the water, it would, it would make him more sick. I think that's the idea of trauma, how it, you know, you see that image every time it, it traumatizes you and makes it worse. However, if a person realizes that this is the same idea as the paraduma by utilizing evil, if they utilize it when Hashem tells us to, um, you know, we should not, you know, get, get too much into it's into the evil. But when we utilize it, when Hashem tells us to, um, we can we can purify ourselves. The Arizal says he brings down the Arizal says a person if he says too many viduim person like um, uh, um, confesses his sins too much, it can be very dangerous, says the Arizal. And in our generation, most of them say, don't think about your sins too much, a little bit. Maybe if you want to say something at night before you go to sleep, that's it. Um, but uh, save it for Yom Kippur. Because thinking about sin too much can make you go back there. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, don't have too much attachment to evil or negativity. It's not good for us. And, and, and I think one of the Hasidic uh, rabbis once said that if you clean something dirty, it makes you dirty. A broom cleaning, a, 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 what was the Magad Mimezrich, perhaps, I believe. And it, the cleaning a dirty floor with a broom makes the broom dirty. So you can't get too involved with evil. But, but on the other hand, when there is evil, we have to realize it's a test. We should, we should utilize it for whatever good it could be. Try to utilize it to... to um, to see it's really nothing and it, it should help us to connect closer, more to Hashem. So those are the main ideas that we've mentioned about this whole, oh, one more thing I wanted to say from this before I sum up everything. This idea, so he brings down Sisechaim, the dangers of Kira Vrachokim. Like we have to do Kira if it's imperative. So many of our brethren are lost. They're not, they're not. A majority of the, a huge majority of the Jewish people was at up to 80, it's 90%, I believe, of our, fellow Jews are not religious. It's, it's, a, it's a real shame. They're missing a beauty of their heritage of the Torah. There's so much to it. But we have to realize to not let it affect our level. Sometimes people lower their levels to bring other people in. We have to not compromise our own Yiddishkeit whenever we're challenged with even doing a good deed. You know, like we don't want to, we don't want to ruin our own standing by by engaging in something like this. So let's remember, it's a danger to rationalize. We shouldn't rationalize too much because see what happened from the reform movement. That's how it all started. That statutes, clicking, they make a lasting relationship with Hashem more than any other mitzvah. This is really, that's so schukas the Torah. The Torah really is the best service of Hashem is when you don't understand, even though we should rationalize a bit to make it sweeter to us, we have to realize the thing Hashem wants is our hearts, we want to connect with you. We don't understand, but you mean our best and you love us. 
the ingredients that the, of the whole thing with the paraduma, the balance is important in life to keep that balance with our mitos. That means our mind should rule over ourselves. That man's main life is for Olam Haba, or Victor Miller. Use the temp beauty of this world and Shabbos Kaidish to remind you of Olam Haba. Misha Tarach B'Shabbos, Yochal B'Shabbos. And last but not least, evil is the test. It's, we're not, we're, it's supposed to clarify you know, what good is, and it could be helpful for growth, not to minimize it, but don't let it take us over, which is what Adamarishan did. He used his he used his own rationale over what Hashem told him to. We started and he internalized evil because of that. Let's just do what Hashem wants, say the evil as a challenge. It's like an arcade game. You're supposed to shoot down the things passing by. And um, and that's how you win the game by focusing on what you have to conquer versus what's about to conquer you. I thank you, ladies, so much for listening. I thank our amazing, stupendous Rivka Shabsov for enabling this whole thing to take place. Next week, we are not having a class for uh, technical reasons. And um, we are continuing in two weeks from now, we're going to have a shear on the three weeks. So don't miss that. And you, it's all lovely to see all your faces every week. And um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful, blessed, beautiful, inspired week. And Mashiach Shakam, today, Hayom Imbukolo Tishmao.